Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to yet another video of mine. Today we'll be doing the third, yes third, iteration of me explaining what dimensions are and how they function. Like I said in my last video about dimensions, just take that one as well as the first one and throw them straight in the trash. I'm starting the explanation all over baby, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get to it. First we'll cover 0D. According to mathematician Leap Along, a point is infinitely small. It has no width, no depth, no height, only location. Math is fun says the same thing, as well as art of problem solving. This basically means that 0D things have no volume whatsoever. They don't take up any space and their only characteristic is a location in the space. Hence the reason why we simply represent them as a dot. The best example we have of 0D things are elementary particles, such as electrons, photons, and Higgs. Destroying any of these things would be considered destroying something that is 0D. But as they don't have a physical existence in the sense that we understand, you'd have to be quite higher dimensional to perform such a feat. One could even say you'd need to be beyond dimensionality as a whole. At the very least, one beyond dimensionality and its laws could easily destroy something zero-dimensional. I'll just leave it at that for now. Next is the first dimension, the x-axis, also known as length. When you exist only in the first dimension, you can only exist and move in two directions, left and right, also known as negative and positive x. Being 1D makes you have length and nothing more. It's the connection between two different points to create a line. College Humor actually made a pretty funny video about this at around a decade ago. God, I'm old. In it, you can see the Transformers characters as 1D constructs. I'll destroy you, Optimus. Let's end this, Megatron. <laughs> Transformers Assemble, Ratchet, Affirmative, Ironhide, Hey Bob, Bumblebee, Autobots Transform. Am I actually seeing this right now? That being said, here's the thing. You're not even a line as a 1D construct like so many people would say. This is because lines have height no matter how small. Go ahead, try and make a line. You'll inevitably give it height no matter how hard you try. Speaking of which, let's move on to just that. The second dimension is height, or width, whatever you prefer. With the second dimension of height, you can be so much more than what a 1D being is. You can have, you know, actual shape, be recognizable, be more than just a simple line. Not just that, there is far more movement. As a 2D being, there's left and right, negative and positive X, down and up, negative and positive Y, or any combination of an X and Y direction, diagonal. Your space is essentially a 2D quadrant, with axes x and y. The third dimension is depth. It's what makes a square a cube and a circle a sphere. Look around you. The walls around you are 3D. The floor you're on is 3D. The chair you may or may not be sitting on is 3D. Even you yourself are 3D. All these things can move across not just the axes x and y, but also z. Yes, I'm Canadian. This turns the quadrant into an octant. This balloons the amount of directions to left and right, negative and positive x, down and up, negative and positive y, backwards and forwards, negative and positive z, and any combination of the three axes. One important note about existing on these three dimensions is that it gives us volume and with density, mass. This is unlike the lower dimensional constructs where volume and mass are just flat out impossible. Before I get to you know what, there's something I need to mention. Hausdorff dimensions and fractals. So this is basically how it goes. Take a line and cut it in half, then cut it in half again. Theoretically, you can do this to infinitum. Now take a square, split it in four, then split it in four again. Theoretically, you can do this to infinitum. Now take a cube, split it in four, then split it in four again. Theoretically, you can do this to infinitum. As these differentially dimensional objects are all divisible by infinite, you'd think that they would all be equally infinite. However, that is not the case, as there are levels of infinity. An infinitely divided cube will always be above an infinitely divided square, which will always be above an infinitely divided line. These three shapes are always going to be separated by infinity. This is essentially the evidence that supports that higher dimensional constructs are infinitely above lower dimensional ones, as there is an infinite amount separating the two constructs, as shown by fractals. Fractals being the infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales, i.e. what you split something infinitely into. One really cool example of fractals is the Sierpinski Triangle. It's essentially the Triforce from Legend of Zelda infinitely divided. 
Yes, I know the shape doesn't originate from Zelda. I just know that's where most of us nerds mostly recognize it from. Cut me some slack, man. And now we get to the big one, 4D. This'll be long, so hold on to your hats. First, we'll cover the most common version of 4D. Three dimensions of space, X, Y, and Z, and one dimension of time, T. According to this site right here, Einstein's theory of special relativity postulates that space and time are interrelated, forming a space-time continuum of three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension. While it is possible to visualize space-time simply by treating time as time and examining snapshots of space-time objects at various points in time, it is also useful to treat space-time geometrically. For example, the distance between two events is the distance between two 4D points. The light cone also has a particular shape that can only be adequately visualized as a 4D object. So basically, space and time is the combination of x, y, z, and t axes, the three initial spatial dimensions and the fourth temporal one. It is the construct of our very own universe. Being able to interact with space-time or move in its direction would mean moving in those four axes simultaneously, as they would be moving left or right, up or down, backwards or forwards, and towards the past or the future. Alas, we 3D beings cannot do such a thing as we're restricted to the third dimension. 4D beings have no such restriction. Moving across the four axes simultaneously includes traveling through space-time to go to the past or future, as well as stopping the flow of time, or doing anything with time for that matter. Unfortunately, while I don't have any problems with what this site claims, it doesn't really have any clear citations that support its legitimacy, which has me a bit worried. As such, I'll also cite this site, written by John D. Norton, a professor who wrote a thesis on space-time. Subsequently, I don't really find it hard to believe that he knows what he's talking about. On the site, Norton says the following, Take snapshots of the Earth orbiting the Sun in three-dimensional space around the Sun in the course of a year, which will look like this. Now we stack them up into a third dimension. When we clean things up a little, we have a space-time. So far, we have described how a two-dimensional space is combined with two extra dimension of time to generate a three-dimensional space-time, such as shown above in the figures. Our space is three-dimensional, so when we add the extra dimension of time, we generate a four-dimensional space-time. This is basically what I explained earlier. The addition of a temporal dimension is what differentiates a 3D space to a 4D space-time, and moving across the four axes of a space-time allows one to move across not just the space, but the time part of space-time. This 2019 paper by Kaochi Akio, a mathematician and winner of the Geometry Prize, a prestigious award in Japan for significant or long-term research in the field of geometry, says the following. Every 4D universe and every 4D punctured universe are open four-dimensional manifolds. Note how Kawauchi called it an open four-dimensional manifold. This brings us to the shape of the universe and subsequently this NASA article. In it, the following is said. The WMAP spacecraft can measure the basic parameters of the Big Bang Theory, including the geometry of the universe. We now know, as of 2013, that the universe is flat with only a 0.4% margin of error. This suggests that the universe is infinite in extent. However, since the universe has a finite age, we can only observe a finite volume of the universe. All we can truly conclude is that the universe is much larger than the volume we can directly observe. Thanks to the WMAP spacecraft, we know with a 0.4% margin of error that the universe is a flat one, and that it has been expanding infinitely so for billions and billions of years, given that according to this article written by astrophysicist Sabrina Steerwalt, our universe is 13.8 billion years old. Which brings us to the grapefruit argument. You may or may not have heard this before, but whether or not you have, I'll reiterate it. In short, you need to be 4D to be universal, but you don't need to be universal to be 4D. Similar to how all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. First, let's look at the beginning of the universe via this article by Dr. Carl... Uh... Kruselnicki? Oh wait, he actually told us how to pronounce it. Nice. Kruselnitsky. Kruselnitsky. Thank you, Doctor. In this article, Kruselnitsky says the following. Very soon after the Big Bang was the inflationary epoch. It began about one millionth of 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 a second after the Big Bang. The universe expanded from much, much smaller than a proton to about the size of a grapefruit. The next notable stage was 3 to 20 minutes after the Big Bang. 
So, simply put, the universe went from much, much smaller than a proton to the size of a grapefruit around the moment of its inception, or more specifically, three minutes after the Big Bang happened. Therefore, it's possible that a 4D space-time construct is smaller than the 93 billion light-years wide universe we know today, or at least the observable one. As a result, suggesting that you can destroy a universe because you can destroy a much, 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 much smaller 4D space-time construct is akin to saying, oh yeah, I can destroy an apple, a 3D construct. Therefore, I can crush a star or a galaxy because they too are 3D constructs. According to this NASA article, the universe contains 4 times 10 to the power of 69 joules of mass energy. Much, 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 much higher than something like, you know, a grapefruit. And, you know, this is exactly why I believe that destroying a universe smaller than our own simply isn't universal. After all, this mass energy is calculated using the formula E equals mass times the speed of light squared. There's absolutely no way a universe the size of, say, 20 million light years in diameter has an equivalent amount of mass energy to our current 93 billion light year sized one. In fact, we even know for a fact that it would have less energy, not just because of mass energy, but because of dark energy as well. This National Geographic article states the following. Scientists now think that the accelerated expansion of the universe is driven by a kind of repulsive force generated by quantum fluctuations in otherwise empty space. What's more, the force seems to be growing stronger as the universe expands. For lack of a better name, the scientists call this mysterious force dark energy. And according to An Introduction to Modern Astrophysics, a book written by Dale Ostile and Bradley Carroll, both physicists, yet extended uniformly throughout the entire universe, this dark energy becomes the dominant influence on the expansion of the universe in this era. As the universe grew from 20 million light years to 93 billion light years in diameter, so too did the dark energy grow stronger. As dark energy is extended uniformly throughout the entire universe, there's no reason to believe that destroying those two differently sized universes would require equivalent energy values. As such, destroying any 4D space-time construct doesn't automatically make you universal. While one could make the argument that via the law of conservation of energy makes it so an expanding universe would have an equivalent amount of energy whether it's expanded or not, that's actually not true. This Scientific American article states the following. As space expands, it releases stored up gravitational potential energy, which converts into the intrinsic energy that fills the newly created volume. This energy is what we call dark energy. This NASA article expands on this, saying the following. The first property that Einstein discovered is that it is possible for more space to come into existence. Then, one version of Einstein's gravity theory, the version that contains a cosmological constant, makes a second prediction. Empty space can possess its own energy. As more space comes into existence, more of this energy of space would appear. As a result, this form of energy would cause the universe to expand faster and faster. One thing I should definitely note is the following. Having complete control of a timeline is a universal level ability, be it range-wise, energy-wise, or, you know, both. According to this Stanford article, it is believed to be a continuum because, so far as we know, there are no missing points in space or instance in time, and both can be subdivided without any apparent limit in size or duration. So, physicists now routinely consider our world to be embedded in this four-dimensional space-time continuum, and all events, places, moments in history, actions, and so on are described in terms of their location in space-time. As we have determined there are no missing points in space-time, we call it a continuum and we consider it impossible for these missing points to even happen. As such, stopping time on a planetary or anything less than universal level would create a massive hole in space-time, as what should be there and at that point in time in space would not be there due to it having been paused for X amount of time. Okay, let's say you pause the flow of time of Earth for about 10 seconds. The problem with doing that is that it creates a time lag between the Earth and the rest of the universe. Reversing or accelerating time is basically the same thing. It pushes back the direction in which the space-time continuum continues. Doing so on anything less than universal scale would separate the section of space-time from the rest of the continuum, something that has never been observed or confirmed to even be possible. Hence why we use the term continuum. I'm sure a lot of you guys and gals have heard of how time is 1D, but if that's the case, how can it be 4D? 
Oh boy. Well, it depends on the context of what you're talking about. Let's look at this paper from Bradford Scow, PhD, in which the difference between space and time are talked about. In it, he says the following. In four-dimensional Minkowski geometry, whether time-like vectors have positive or negative lengths, time is one-dimensional and space is three-dimensional. Perhaps it is because it is one-dimensional that time is time. Before examining this thesis, I'll say something about what it means to say that time is one-dimensional. Intuitively speaking, to say that time is one-dimensional is to say that we can represent time as a line, and that all events that occur in time can be assigned a position on that line. Each three-dimensional submanifold is a time, and the sequence gives their temporal ordering. Since every event occurs somewhere in space-time, every event occurs somewhere in this one-dimensional sequence. So time is one-dimensional in the intuitive sense in these space-times because it divides up in this way. Time, or the fourth dimension, on its own is one-dimensional, as explained here. But at the same time, time is the result of space existing. A third-dimensional space will inevitably create a temporal ordering, as Scal put it, so that causality exists. This makes it so that time cannot exist without space, making affecting time, or more accurately, space-time, 4D. I actually have a pretty nice analogy to explain this very idea in simpler terms. It may sound a bit weird, but bear with me. The universe as a space-time continuum acts as a film reel, with the space being what's shown in the reel, and the time being the forward flow of the reel. With that in mind, when you erase a section of time, you erase the real section, inevitably erasing the space within it as well. Time cannot exist without space, and so while it is 1D in the sense that it is a single unidirectional line, it's 4D in the practical sense, as seen how time-related abilities function in fiction. Another thing I should note about space-time is the myth that being 4D spatio-temporally speaking makes you inherently stronger than a 3D being. This is not entirely accurate. Going back to Scow's article, he says the following. There is another role that time-like directions play in some familiar laws that space-like directions do not. Quantities like mass, charge, and energy are conserved in time-like directions, but not in space-like directions. Scow basically states here that temporal dimensions do not change the mass, charge, and energy of constructs within space-time continuums. In other words, adding temporal dimensions doesn't change your mass energy in any way. In even simpler terms, gaining temporal dimensions to your existence does not make you stronger. At the very least, stronger in the sense that we understand it to be, i.e. being able to output more energy. This means that a 3D being can have more mass energy than a 4D being, much like how Jupiter has more energy than a grapefruit-sized universe. Finally, I'll do my best to describe how a 4D space-time construct exists and where you'd see it on a timeline of a universe. Using the film reel from earlier, let's say you have this 4D being called A. A has four axes, X, Y, Z, and T. Let's give him the spatial sizes, i.e. length, height, and depth of the average man. Now, let's give him a temporal, quote-unquote, size. As a 4D being, he wouldn't exist at one point of the timeline as we do. He would exist across multiple points of the timeline. It could be as small as 12 p.m. to 12.01 p.m., or as long as 10,000 years ago to 10,000 years in the future. Funny enough, though, we would see a 4D being just as we see a 3D being, with only length, height, and depth. This is because we can only see one point of the timeline, the present. We don't see the past or the future. And I think that's pretty much all I have to say about 4D space-time, so I'll move on to the less common 4D space. 4D space is much rarer, so I won't spend too much time on it, and we'll just give the basics. According to this educational site, In a 4D world, there is another directional axis which is perpendicular to the X, Y, and Z axes. We shall label this axis W, and call the direction along this axis the fourth direction. This new axis also has positive and negative directions, which we shall refer to as positive W and negative W. The addition of a fourth spatial direction, W, creates a construct that our minds simply cannot comprehend. The closest thing we have to a visualization of the fourth dimension is the tesseract. This new measurement is sometimes called trength, and this measurement is supposed to be perpendicular to length, height, and depth. Carl Sagan explains it best here. Now, let's take this three-dimensional cube and project it, carry it, to a fourth physical dimension. Not that way, not that way, not that way, but 
at right angles to those three directions. I can't show you what direction that is, but imagine that there is a fourth physical dimension. In that case, we would generate a four-dimensional hypercube, which is also called a tesseract. I cannot show you a tesseract because I and you are trapped in three dimensions. But what I can show you is the shadow in three dimensions of a four-dimensional hypercube or tesseract. This is it. And you can see it's two nested cubes, all the vertices connected by lines. And now the real tesseract in four dimensions would have all the lines of equal length and all the angles right angles. That's not what we see here, but that's the penalty of projection. So you see, while we cannot imagine the world of four dimensions, we can certainly think about it perfectly well. With this strength comes something new. 2D objects have area. 3D objects have area and volume. 4D objects have area, volume, and something else. We often call this something else hypervolume, and with it comes hypermass. It's easier to explain it using numbers, so let's say you have a 10 meter cube made of rock. 10 times 10 times 10 gives a cube with a volume of 1,000 cubic meters. Using the density of rock, we find that the cube is 2,700,000 kilograms. While this 3D cube has a mass, 4D space constructs would have a higher tier measurement than volume, and this would result in a higher tier of mass, hypermass. As mass is interconnected with energy, as shown in potential energy formulas and kinetic energy formulas, this subsequently results in a higher tier of energy, something larger than anything a 3D construct could do. Using Hausdorff dimensions, it would be something infinitely larger. One other thing I want to bring up about a 4D spatial construct is how we would perceive it. It would essentially be the same as to how we 3D beings would interact with a 2D being. Again, Sagan explains it best here. Let's imagine that we are perfectly flat. I mean absolutely flat. And that we live, appropriately enough, in a flatland. A land designed and named by Edwin Abbott, a Shakespearean scholar who lived in Victorian England. Everybody in flatland is, of course, exceptionally flat. We have squares, circles, and triangles, and we all scurry about, and we can go into our houses and do our flat business. Now, we have width and length, but no height at all. Now, these little cutouts have some little height, but uh, let's ignore that. Let's imagine that these are absolutely flat. That being the case, we know, us flatlanders, about left, right, and we know about forward, back, but we have never heard of up, down. Let us imagine that into flatland, hovering above it, comes a strange three-dimensional creature which, oddly enough, looks like an apple. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square, watches it enter its house, and decides in a gesture of interdimensional amity to say hello. Hello, says the three-dimensional creature. How are you? I am a visitor from the third dimension. Well, the poor square looks around his closed house, sees no one there, and what's more, has witnessed a greeting coming from his insides, a voice from within. He surely is getting a little worried about his sanity. The three-dimensional creature is unhappy about being considered a psychological aberration, and so he descends to actually enter Flatland. Now, a three-dimensional creature exists in Flatland only partially, only a plane, a cross-section through him can be seen. So, when the three-dimensional creature first reaches Flatland, it's only the points of contact which can be seen, and we'll represent that by stamping the apple in this ink pad and placing that image in Flatland. And as the apple were to descend through, slither by Flatland, we would progressively see higher and higher slices, which we can represent by cutting the apple. So the square 
as time goes on, sees a set of objects mysteriously appear from nowhere and inside a closed room and change their shape dramatically. His only conclusion could be that he's gone bonkers. As Sagan explained, we'd see a 4D being as a 3D being, but changing drastically in a direction we couldn't even imagine. As he said, we'd think that seeing such a thing means we went crazy, when in reality we'd only be seeing three-fourths of a whole being, limited by our own dimensionality. And this brings us to the fifth dimension, which is where things get really, really messy. Barring things like string theory, being of the fifth dimension would mean having a fifth dimension to your existence. Obviously. I usually assume that it's a spatial one, as my criteria for being 5D is existing beyond the 4D space-time continuum that is the universe. This is because you physically cannot fully fit inside of it. It can only hold the first three spatial dimensions of your existence, as, remember, the universe is only 3D, spatially speaking. That being said, the extra dimensions could be a temporal one, which would be weird. Via this paper from Max Tegmark, a professor and researcher with a PhD in physics, we get this wonderful graph that explains it better than I ever could. Under the graph, Tegmark wrote the following. When the partial difference equations of nature are elliptic or ultra-hyperbolic, physics has no predictive power for an observer. In the remaining hyperbolic cases, n more than 3 may fail on the stability requirement, atoms are unstable, and n less than 3 may fail on the complexity requirement, no gravitational attraction, topological problems. Most of this is simply arguing that spacetimes with fewer dimensions than ours would fall short in the complexity needed to give life like us, and that spacetimes with more dimensions than ours are too complicated and would ruin stability. However, what's important here is the acknowledgement of the existence of spacetimes with fewer and higher spatiotemporal dimensions than our 4D one, meaning you can have 3D spacetimes with two dimensions of time and one dimension of space. 4D spacetimes with two dimensions of space and two dimensions of time. 9D spacetimes with six dimensions of space and three dimensions of time. The possibilities are essentially infinite. One final thing I'll add to being 5D is how your speed is affected. While being 4D affecting your speed always depends on how much you can mess with spacetime, being 5D is pretty cut and dry. The velocity formula is V equals distance divided by time. As a 5D being, you're infinitely above both 3D space and 4D time, via Hausdorff dimensions. As such, you'd have infinite speed. Not velocity, speed. Infinite velocity is just being able to cover an infinite 3D distance, or covering a finite 3D distance in an infinitely small time frame. 6D and above is basically the same as 5D, just the addition of more spatial or temporal dimensions. Oh, that reminds me! One time, someone told me that because we can move from 7am to 8am like this, time is 2D and not 1D. The funny thing is, the guy was half right. We'd be able to time travel like this if time was 2D, but obviously we can't move to whatever point in time we want as easily as he said we could. According to Ask a Physicist, Boosts are an interchange of space direction and time direction, and in 3 plus 2D space, you can have a rotation that exchanges the two time directions. Importantly, this new rotation can smoothly take events in your future and take them into your past. That is to say, in 3 plus 2 dimensional space, you should be able to turn around in time and face the past. This basically means that you could travel through time easily if we lived in a spacetime with two temporal dimensions. Finally, I think I'll talk about being outerversal, although there isn't much to say. Basically, being outerversal is being beyond dimensionality as a whole, existing outside the physical universe or multiverse made out of its dimensions. There can be multiple classes of outerversal. If you exist beyond the dimensionality of a universe with four spatio-temporal dimensions, I'd consider you outer on a 4D scale. If you do so with a multiverse with infinite dimensions, I'd consider you outer on an infinite D scale. Regardless, you'd have irrelevant speed and be outer. It's just a question of how many dimensions you exist beyond. Now, let's review. 0D, no physical size, only location, depicted as a point. 1D, length, formed by the connection of two points, depicted as a line. 2D, length and height, formed by the connection of multiple lines, depicted as 2D shapes. 3D, length, height, and depth, formed by the connection of multiple 2D shapes, as seen in our 3D world. 4D spacetime, 
length, height, and depth with the addition of time, formed by combining the three spatial dimensions with the one of time. Our universe is an example of a 4D space-time construct. 4D space, length, height, depth, and strength formed by combining 3D shapes at angles perpendicular to the three dimensions that we know. The Tesseract is an example of a 4D shape. 5D and beyond, more dimensions than our 4D universe, usually spatial ones, meaning they mostly exist outside of it, while they can fit the first three spatial dimensions of their existence within our space-time continuum. Outerversal, basically just being beyond dimensionality as a whole. And thus ends my lecture or whatever. Although I should drop a couple disclaimers here. The first disclaimer is one I alluded to a while ago. This is a standard model of applying dimensions to fiction and should not be used for verses with established dimensional systems like DC following string theory. Trying to apply what I explained here just won't work in those cases. The second disclaimer is I'm no physicist. I'm just a massive nerd that has a large interest in this kind of stuff. As such, I could totally be wrong on any of the things I said here, which is why I try my best to use reputable sources when I do give my explanations. If there's anything incorrect in my assertions, please tell me in the comment section below. Hope you guys and gals enjoyed this video of mine, and if you did and want to see more like it, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe while clicking that beautiful bell. If you're willing to help me live and make these videos come out faster, you can financially support me on either PayPal or Patreon. For only $5, you can join my Discord server, Shinsekai, where I can help you learn all the tips and tricks to calcing, scaling, and of course, all this dimensional stuff. With all that said, see you guys and gals next time.